<laughs> okay, uh, welcome. My name is Rabbi Lawrence. I see a new faces over here. So we're gonna do like a 30 minute class. And the topic, I thought, hello. Hi, sorry. And the topic, no, no, it's okay, it's not comfortable. <laughs> and the topic I thought we would look at today um, is not something you actually think about too much, but it's really been part of the Jewish people for thousands of years. Can I translate to French? You're getting me. <laughs> it's good? <laughs> Where? Yeah. I don't say we, you say where, sounds cool, right? Exactly. Ah, yeah. cool. We doesn't work, it's where, right? <laughs> so the, um, the discussion I want to talk about, I kind of talk, call this class, Why Jews Move, or those who you know, know some reggae, Movement of the People. Because if you look at our history, I mean, if people around this table, I'm going to guess, come from, well, if you don't, even if you're born here, which not all of you are, um, your parents, Maybe you came from America. Grandparents, great-grandparents, I don't know, how many people here had grandparents who were born in America? Wow, one person, wow. You too? Actually, two grandparents. Two grandparents. I have a great-grandparent. And great-grandparent, that's unusual. That's unusual. But before then, right, where did they come from? Ukraine. Ukraine? Iran and Italy. Iran and Italy. Morocco. Morocco. Tunisia and Algeria. Tunisia and Algeria, wow. All the terrorist states being represented over here, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I'm Persian as well, I can make that joke. Yes. Ukraine, Ukraine Poland. Yeah. Azerbaijan. Ooh, I did an Azerbaijani wedding. That's a lot of fun. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I have a couple, yeah? Uh, Poland and Turkey. Poland and Turkey. Very good. Um, a town in Poland called Khmelnik. Where, where? Khmelnik. Khmelnik, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, very famous. Uh, um, Lithuania, Hungary, Lithuania, and Russia. Wow. Germany. Germany, straight yaki all the way back? <laughs> wow. Do you know where in Germany? No, but different places. All four grandparents, different places. And they were survivors, your grandparents? Yeah. Grandparents. They left before the war, they went through the war? Went through. Wow. Washington. Incredible. You know we do a Poland trip, by the way. Just I did. On Mount Poland trip? With Rabbi Lynn. Oh, with Rabbi Lynn. Oh, very good. And yourself? No, uh, Russia. Russia, pure Russian. So you were born here? Yeah, right. on side. Very, very good. We're just doing where families come from, because that's going to be the discussion. Where did your family originally come from? Poland. Poland? Same. Same. <laughs> same Poland. Oh, we're sisters. Oh, that's yeah. it. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think your sisters actually explains that, yeah? Hungary. Hungary. Whereabouts? Budapest? Like outside it, yeah. Just outside it. Poland. Poland. Uh, Russia and Ukraine. Russia, Ukraine. You have to remember that Poland really was for the Ashkenazi Jews like the America of its day. Everyone was in Poland for hundreds of years. You know, we look at Poland as a Holocaust kind of thing, and like that's, But for hundreds of years, I was actually in the Warsaw Cemetery, uh, which is an incredible place to go to. It sounds weird to talk about a cemetery that way. There's 300,000 Jews buried there. It's a really it's a fascinating place. And by the way, it's great for PhD students. They love going there, and Israelis, as an aside. You get to learn a lot and see a lot of, um, you know. Jewish history, look at the tombstones, it's re 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 reveal so much to you. Amen. What are you drinking there? You know, I, made a, I made a sangria, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh and wine. <laughs> you know what? It's Rabbi's going to drink too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all give, I've got to taste some. That is really good, by the way, it's a great wine. I've got to try that. So the discussion we want to have for the short time we have together is why we Jews move so much. We've been all over the place. And if you look at Jewish history, actually world history, our portion in it, it's a little uncanny. Now, there's a number of themes that move with us through history. Anti-Semitism is one of the classics, you know. We Jews have always had to deal with anti-Semitism. But that's not so much the idea tonight. What I'm talking about is why Jews move. I want to do, with your permission, a short recap of all of Jewish history. And I need like 120 seconds to do it. Is that okay? Are we cool with that? Okay. So let's start. You'll see the theme. It's, it's just so glaring, so obvious. The Jewish history is full of it, you know? Let's go back to the beginning. We have Adam and Eve. It's actually world history, if you will. And they're in the Garden of Eden, wherever that was. And uh, they sinned, and they were kicked out of the garden. Okay, they weren't killed. They were kicked out. Eventually, they had son Cain and Abel. Right, Cain killed Abel. Sound familiar? And Cain had to become a wanderer. That became his punishment for doing what he did, for killing his brother, his grandsons. And then, carrying for many generations, we got to Noah. As Noah, we know he of the ark, his generation was wiped out, for whatever reasons, not for now, and he was on a ship, right? An ark they had built, and it had to float around for a year. Now, he could have gone on vacation to Israel. God could have put him in Israel, because actually, according to our commentators, 
the land of Israel wasn't affected directly, at least, by the flood. So you could have sat all the animals in Elat. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, that's if Elat is part of biblical Israel. But we'll leave that aside anyway. Definitely Yerushalayim or Tel Aviv, you know. Instead, it has to be put on a ship. It has to move around. <coughs> then 10 generations later, we get the time of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. And he is doing very well in the place where he comes from, ur Kasdim, which is actually modern-day Iraq. And he's living in modern-day Iraq for a long time. There's some chairs back there. You can grab them. Hi, welcome. Good to see you. And he's in modern Iraq or Kastim, and he's doing a great job. He's spending his whole life changing people, him and his wife. They created a whole Jewish outreach, Mayor, JEC, Chabad, whatever you want to call it, movement, you know, of bringing Jews together and connecting. And then God said to him, remember, Lech Lacha, which means go. We're going to come back to that statement, very important statement. It's going to speak to us as well. And he has to travel, and he travels to Israel. That's where he has to go. He has to travel out of Israel, go back to Israel, and then he has children, Isaac, Jacob, Isaac, not so much movement, but Jacob, Yaakov, he goes out of Israel with Lavan, visit his, live with his uncle, he gets his wife, he comes back to Israel, eventually he has 12 sons and daughters, right, the 12 tribes, they grow up, they have to move from Israel down to Egypt, and that's the whole Egyptian exile, how long are you in Egypt for? 210 years in Egypt, and we grow from a small, like 70 people, to Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Eventually, in the Jewish year, 2448, that's actually the only year you have to know. I always tell my students, I teach college, the only one year you have to know when it comes to Judaism. Months of the year and dates within the months, you've got to know. That's very important. But actual years, this is the key one. 2448, right? Which is 3,328 years ago. That's the year we left Egypt, got to Mount Sinai, um, and received the Torah. So that's a pretty epic year for the Jewish people, you know? The whole movie Ten Commandments and Prince of Egypt was focused on that one year. So something happened big in that year. And then we left, okay, and we went to the desert. And we stayed in the desert for 40 years. Now, during those 40 years, we escaped Egypt. You would have thought that we were to sit comfortable in one place. No! There were 42 journeys that happened over that time. And the journeys happened very unusually. We weren't told ahead of time. The cloud would move, right? The Levim, the Kohanim, were told to pick up the Ark and all the other stuff and start walking, the whole tabernacle, and the Jews followed. And we couldn't sit still, even in the desert, 42 years. Eventually, we get to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, okay? Oh, finally, 40 years later, someone got the right directions, and we end up in the Holy Land of Israel. And we thought, that's it. We finally arrived. Had we gone in El Al, we would have arrived later, because El Al stands for every landing always late. And, uh, which actually is a good joke in the 80s, but now they've got very good things. And um, that good, good, great airline. Please fly them. Um, and we arrive in the land of Israel, and we're there for hundreds of years. Eventually, we, have, we start the kings. We have King David. I right, took over from Saul. And King David has a son called King Solomon, Shlomo Melech, and he builds the first of a temple which stands for hundreds of years, 400 years, a little bit north of 400 years. The temple stands, eventually it's destroyed by the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar destroys it. Okay, That's the first ever real exile the Jews have been since we've been in Israel. And for most of the part, we get kicked out over a period of years, and we're out for 70 years. Actually, the prophet Jeremiah told us, and that's actually that we're going to be 70 years in that exile, that, that bleeds into the Persian exile, Okay, because the majority of the Jewish people ended up after Babylon in Persia. Okay. And actually in the capital of Persia, that's when the whole Purim story happened. All right? There were 70 years in between the first temple and the second temple. And we're in the capital. What was the capital of Persia? That's right, Great Neck. And <laughs> what isn't? That's what they told me. I don't know. <laughs> so the capital back then was a place called Shushan, which is actually modern day. Anyone know what it's called today? Shushan? Hamadan. And there's a great video, which I just posted on Facebook, actually, um, of the tomb of Mordechai and Esther, right, the hero and heroine of the Purim story, actually in Hamadan. People, my family and others I know would go every Purim or Purim and actually visit the tombs of Mordechai and Esther. They actually kept that, and it's there until ISIS arrived. But until now, thank God, they managed to actually preserve that holy site and have respect for it. They see Esther is a very important biblical figure, even the Persians do. Okay, so the 70 years there, so that bleeds, that's the second exile. We have the first, that's the Babylonian exile. There's four exiles the Jews have to go through. Some say five, that's another discussion for now. And then we end up with the Persian exile. Then, not the majority, many of the Jews go back. Cyrus, Esther's son, allows us to build the second temple. Okay, second temple was bigger, but not better. 
Okay, the level of holiness, the second level of knowledge goes to the first one, but we have a temple that's there. 200 years later, the Greeks arrive, Alexander the Great. We have the whole Hanukkah story, it's about 200 years into the second temple period. We managed to push them off. We last another 200 years till the Romans come and they destroy the temple. Now things are not good. Now, there's really Jews around. Oh, by the way, Ethiopian Jews, as a side point, when you take trips to Israel, we take them to absorption centers to meet Ethiopian um, immigrants that just arrived. And a wonderful, wonderful group. So, so just was really, really a very powerful experience. We took it to Masi, we took it to, no, but Ethiopian, no. So we started to do that. And um, they believe that they are direct descendants of King Solomon. And they say that they were from the original first exile the Jews went out from. They came, they actually believe they're from the, the tribe of Dan. Dan, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of Jacob's sons that became a fan of him, a tribe. And they believe actually they come from that, which is, and it's actually fascinating because they don't have the Purim or Hanukkah story, which makes sense time-wise because that happened after the first exile, you see. So the fact they don't have those rabbinic holidays. So they missed out on that, isn't that weird? There's no homotash or dreidel for them, you know? Now they arrive in Israel, they became part of the Jewish people in Israel and they were absorbed into general Israeli society. Okay, so the Jewish people are kicked out, the second temple is destroyed, Romans come along, right? Many go to Rome and all over the world. Then the majority, the real epic period after that is the Babylonian period, right? There's Jews in Babel, modern day Iraq, and then that moves to Europe and we end up in Spain. Now you all have Spain, the golden era of the Jewish people. That's actually a very good time for the Jewish people. Uh, until 1492, when Columbus, sail the ocean blue, and Ferdinand Isabella, your Mom, kicks us out, okay? And the Jews were actually left to leave, okay? Unless they wanted to kiss the cross, which some did, okay? The Muranas, as they were called, okay? But many, many left. And there was a movement after that time into Europe itself and into the rest of the Middle East. There were Jews elsewhere at the time, but that was one big influx as well. Most of you here today, we're going to assume, come at least one ancestor for sure from that exile of Spain. Either Sparad, right? Sparad is that original exile. Many went to Europe, okay? Um, Poland starts to get very, very big in the 15, 1600s. Actually, it happened in the 1300s, but in the 1500s, and that's where most of you, most of your grandparents, you're purely Sephardi. Most of your ancestors came from Poland and passed through Poland at one point, and that builds up, okay? Germany, France, we have the Rishonim, the early 11, 12, 13, 1400s. The Middle East is filling up as well, right? We have all the Middle Eastern countries that are building. We have the Persian Empire that's built, Jews in Persia, Jews in Iraq, and over the Middle East and Algeria, and all these other countries are suddenly building, 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 building. Jews always, by the side point, there were always Jews in Israel the entire time. From the beginning of our conversation right through, there's always been Jews. I was actually in Israel a few, uh, two months ago for a friend's son's bar mitzvah, and the uh, military, uh, the police spokesman, a good friend of mine, Mickey Rosenfeld, I grew up with him, very cool guy, his wife, her family are 19 generations, Yerushalmi, from Jerusalem, 19 generations, in the old city, and her grandmother lives in the old city, there was one period they had to leave when the state of Israel was founded, she had to leave, then she came back, and she still lives right there, isn't that wild? We've always had a connection to the land of Israel, no matter what they tell you, online and other places. Now the Jews only it's a recent thing. This is not true. Okay, we've also had a connection over there. And then things got really interesting. Okay, we saw the Holocaust obviously in the late 1930s, 40s. German Jews kind of felt it was coming. They left, many of them, some stayed, and you know what happened to them. Polish Jewry never saw it coming and they probably got it the worst. There were many early aliyahs in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They managed to get to Israel. Survivors ended up where? In Israel and in America. America probably one of the, uh, you know, second biggest population. Although, according to Bibi Netanyahu, actually the amount of Jews in Israel and outside of Israel is actually the, about the same, interestingly enough. Um, America's probably got the biggest, second big population. The third biggest population of Jews is France, okay? But even that's changing, as we said a moment ago. They're, they're getting out. They're selling the house on the Champs-Élysées and they're buying a nice place in Netanya. <laughs> nice. Very nice. The rest of us, we can't afford to buy houses there. The French are coming. Baruch Hashem is a wonderful thing. Okay. <laughs> we love it. Then there's all other fascinating thing which I'm obsessed with, which is all the Jews that leave Israel to come to America. Do you know how many Jews, Israelis, there are in America today? Israelis in America today? Have a guess. Throughout a number. 500,000. 
So officially, there are 500, I'm officially saying a million. One million? Mm, one million. Isn't that crazy? And all of them are selling creams and t-shirts in the malls, in the Agalot and all the things over there. You can't walk into a mall nowadays without an Israeli like, come, I put a Havak cream on your hand. I'm like, love cream on my hand. That's not going to happen, Uri. Put it away. <laughs> By the way, they make a ton of money, those people. Uh -huh. They know what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? They're all over you. Like the old grandma, Jewish grandma, turned up in Lyle into the malls. Oh, they got them. They got their number. So just in that short, brief version, we see that Jewish history is full of us. What is the secret behind this? What is going on over here? So there's many answers to this. Okay, first of all, anti-Semitism has a major part that put us all around there. But there's got to be a deeper reason for this. And incredibly, there is. Let's go back to one of the first famous movements, and that is the movement of Abraham. Now, Abraham was doing very, very well spiritually. He was affecting thousands and thousands of people in a city called Ur Kastim, where he was. And then God came to him and said, hey, you got to go. How did he say go? Lech lecha. Now, lech means move. Go, right? So, lech, go, right? It doesn't say lech, it says lech lecha. Same letters, but different vowels. What does lecha mean? Anybody know? So, what to do. so actually, it's interesting. There's different ways of actually interpreting that. Rashi gives a couple of answers as well. One answer is for you. For you, this is lecha. This is for you. This is for your benefit. You're going to benefit from this. Meaning that naturally, you wouldn't think so. Schlepping around, moving around, costs us money, costs us time, effort, the ability to reproduce as a people, also get stunted by travel and movement, okay? But don't worry, says God, this is gonna be for you. That's one interpretation. But I wanna show another one, which is also very, very important. And that is, lecha means to you. Travel, go to you. What, is, what does to you mean? That means to yourself. You're gonna discover something about yourself by moving. Things that you never thought were possible are going to become possible by you not being here. You think you're doing well over here in Urukastim, affecting all these people? You are! But there's something even bigger, something even better, and it's waiting for you. Now, his eventual destination was the land of Israel, but he wasn't told that, interest. it's actually missing. He doesn't say, go to Israel, jump on a plane and off you go. He didn't say that. He says, go to the land I'm going to show you, all right? I'm going to show you the land, but right now you don't know where it is. Why is that? Why can't he give him the destination? So basic question, just say you're going to leave, here's your ticket, and off you go to Tel Aviv. You're going to land at Ben Gurion, okay, which didn't exist at that point. Um, it was just a small, you know, strip. Mm. But why is that, why does he say you're going to this place? Free choice, I mean free will. Okay, free will. <laughs> Definitely keeps his free will going. Why else? Then maybe that's all the focus on with the employees. Beautiful, Marcy. You see, if Abraham was told exactly where he was going, he'd be like, no matter what happens to me, I got a destination. But he wasn't told. He wasn't, he was just told to go. Meaning that any travel that we have done, I'm going to apply this to a personal level as well. This is not just a geographical statement. Any travel that we do, is not just about the destination, it's about the journey. We are the people of movement. There's something in the journey itself which is a means to an itself, not just a means to an end. There's something about moving and traveling. This is actually very, very much to point out. Which holiday celebrates the exit from Egypt? Maybe that? Passover, right? Well, just, ah, right? Read the Haggadah. You sit with your grandparents, right? You got your great uncle, like, when are we going to eat? You know that whole thing. Maxwell Agoda comes out. And we're obsessed with this holiday, and it's a great holiday. Which holiday celebrates the entry into Israel 40 years later? There isn't one. How weird is that? The whole reason we left Egypt was to get to Israel. Wasn't the whole purpose? And there we are, so we left, okay. Let's make a big let's go to Israel, let's, I don't know, make Fluffel Day. All right, we'll wait flags, I don't know, we'll eat Fluffel and we'll all like, you know, be rude to each other and honk while we drive. We'll find some way to celebrate and get angry with people. Like when the, when the light, you know, in Israel, the driving in Israel, you know what I'm saying? When the light turns green in New York, as soon as it turns green, they honk. Taxi <laughs> drivers are like, Arr! it goes red, green, Arr! in Israel, they take that to a Zen level. They actually honk you while it's still red. <laughs> like, what the heck, it's red. Right, the guy's honking you, eh, 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 taxi, and you're like, hey, 
זה אדום! And he says, it will be green soon. By the time he says, Jews have, Israelis have no patience, but this is, the secret of this, by the way. It's all connected, right? Drive in Israel, I drive in Manhattan, I'm always, I'm like, all right, in Israel, I'm like, please don't do that. It is actually scary. So Abraham Vida was told to, the Jewish people were told to go. There were two great journeys in Jewish history. Abraham leaving Ur Kasdim, where he was extremely successful with his wife, Sarah, leaving a metropolis, and the Jews leaving Egypt, which was the opposite of everyone. Everyone was going to Egypt, and we left. They're like, we want to leave, all this. everything's here. And even once we left, many of them wanted to go back, and many didn't leave. 80% according to our tradition didn't even leave, they wanted to stay. 80%. Chamushim Yalu, Torah tells us, Bishalaf, only 20% left. Why? Right? Because the ones that left, though, knew that something big was going to happen to us. And this is the secret to Jewish history, by the way. We are Akshanim. We go against the grain. Everyone says this, we're like, nah, it's not for us. Funny, the only way the Jewish people as a nation, this is just too good, the only way the Jewish people as a nation are described in the Torah is Am Kishay Oref which means a stiff-necked people. Now that's not, you know, obviously Jews always complain about their necks, but it's not a physical thing, right? But it's a, it's a metaphor, right? Because when you want to pull a Jew, right, to do the right thing, it's like, uh, 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 I'm going my way, I'm not going to do it, right? But when a Jew's on the right path, you want to push him away, like, no, I'm sticking with my people, I'm sticking with my God, right? We're stiff-necked, we're not willing to look around, right? We're akshanim, we're, we're obstinate. We always go against the grain. Everyone says this, Right? We're like, no, give all your money away. Right? Every politician, right? every leader, right? every ism has got a Jew involved in it. This is where it comes from. It's actually put into our DNA. Now, I can't prove that to you, because right? there's psychological reasons and psychological reasons and anthropological reasons and every type of reason you can think of. But I'm telling you, there's a spiritual root to this. And this is it. So Abba always said, Lech Lecha, go for yourself. There's something about your movement that's going to change the world. As someone once said, ships are very safe in the harbor, but that's not what they're made for. You know? Now, let's take it to the next level. And it goes like this. I'm nearly finished. Okay, we Jews are about movement. And we realize that there's some change that needs to happen in the world. By the way, interestingly enough, water follows the same pattern. Water that sits still evaporates. Right? It stagnates. How do you keep water fresh? You've got to keep it moving. We humans are mostly made up of water. And what else does movement, that means we have to keep going. What else does movement do to a people? As I say, what are the consequences of this? Well, you end up staying closer to your nation. Because when you end up getting too comfortable in a nation and becoming like them, we assimilate and we disappear. Okay, we get too comfortable. So if you were God, which for some of you may be easy to imagine, but if you were, you want to keep your, your nation moving, right? You want to keep, because when you move, you kind of like, you know, you stay together. It's a sign of after. When we get too comfortable, you kind of forget where we come from, you know? If you look through history, that's kind of the way it works, you know? But uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you're traveling somewhere and you get to the airport. You know that feeling when you first went to the airport, we all have? You got your suitcase with you. I mean, I have this. And everyone's moving around and it looks like they all know where they're going except you. Because you know where your gate is, you know what I'm saying? What does that do to you? It humbles you. Right? It keeps you kind of focused. It's a very, it's very, very humbling experience because all your possessions that you own, you can have all the money in the world, but right now it's you against all these foreigners and two suitcases. Right? If you're Jewish and traveling to Israel, always two suitcases, one's never enough, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just, and you're like, wow. It's a very humbling experience for us. Right? So it keeps us in our place as well, all this movement. Movement as well is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for something else. So it's real, it's true, we've had to move, but we don't wanna move. Moving is very, very difficult and time constraining and physically and anti-Semitism, but there's benefits that come from it. We've already looked at a couple of them. It keeps you active, keeps you connected. But it's also a metaphor for something else, which is learning, asking questions. What is a question? A question is a departure, isn't it? If you think about it, I am here. I need to know what's the answer to boop, boop, boop. And I've asked my question. And then I get an answer. Once I get an answer, I stop. The journey is over. Wanting to educate ourselves, which we Jews are obsessed with, 
if you think about it, is a journey in some sense. I'm taking a new, not always geographical, but sometimes it is, but I'm moving forward in order to discover, in order to learn. The Jewish way of learning, interestingly enough, not coincidentally, is a system of question-answer. We Jews are obsessed with asking questions. And sometimes we get answers, but we don't always like the answers, but that's okay. Because it's not about the answer, which is the destination. It's about the question, which is the departure. And what are you saying when you have a question? I don't know, which is a sign of humility, isn't it? I don't know, so I'm willing to ask. You all have friends who know every answer to everything, and they're available to be around, because they're completely arrogant. But a good person is a person who's like, I know a lot, but that I don't know. That, that's a great question. Let me, let me think about that. Many times in yeshiva, I went to university, in university, and I even teach university, universities for the most part are acquiring information. They're like one answer for another. But in yeshiva, it's very, very different. In yeshiva, you learn, you ask questions. Then they give you an answer, and you have a question on the answer, so you smash down the answer, then you have another question, which is a little bit better than the one before, and then you smash down that one, because you get an answer, and you smash the answer, and it's all building and smashing, building and smashing. It's a constant process, it's a constant journey that doesn't stop. It just goes on and on and on. And many times you have an answer, and the rabbi says, oh, that, that's great, but I got a question. And he asks questions, he says, you know what, my question is better than your answer. Is that I got an answer to your question, but your question was better than my answer. It sounds weird, you know? But the greatest person is one of the greatest questions. So that's really the history of the Jewish people. We're a people of movement geographically, but the geographical movement is just a, a metaphor as well for a desire to move and learn and change and push against with the, with the counterculture. And you get that by asking questions. So why is that the way it has to be? So every ism comes out of that. Because so I'm always pushing back because I want to know. And when I discover, I want to know again. And if you say that's the answer, I don't agree. And I want to change the whole system. Because right? the whole system must be wrong. Because I've got a question to defeat it. We don't go with the flow. It's not part of our nature. We're always against it. I'll finish with a quick story. If you don't mind. I don't like stories. Who doesn't like a story? <laughs> So the story is told of a man, a very wealthy businessman, who wanted to find a potential partner for his daughter. Now this is before J-Date and J-Swipe and all the other J's. And so what he, used, what he did was, he decided he was going to go to the local yeshivas because he wanted to find a good scholar. This is back in the old country. And he's going to pose a question. He's going to pose a question. And whoever had the answer to his question can meet his daughter and potentially marry her. Big offer, right? wealthy father-in-law. By the way, wealthy father-in-law was the best thing, but that's a side point. So anyway, off he goes, and he arrives in the first big, big yeshiva in Europe, and he opens his books, and all the boys are sitting waiting, young kids, and he asks the question, and they're like, oh my God, and they all line up, and they give an answer, and he's like, no. Next, give an answer, no. No, 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 no. And what well, the answer? Packs up his bags, gets on his horse, goes to the next yeshiva. Same thing, a line of guys, and they hear the question, such a crazy question that involves Talmudic law and Rishon and Makhron, all the learning commentators, lady commentators, it's such a complicated question, but they all feel they have the right answer, right? Every Jewish man thinks he's got the right answer, until he gets married. And there's a big long line, and they come forward, and like, I got the answer! It's like, no, 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 no! And the same thing happens, packs up his bags and leaves, and he goes from Yeshiva to Yeshiva to Yeshiva, town to town to town, but she ends up in some small little town, the end of Europe, Right, and there's a small yeshiva there of like some raggly, taggly guy sitting there. And they all line up. And there's one little kid, little Moshe. And he's convinced, <laughs> he's convinced he's got the right answer to this question. I think I know where this is going. And then he gets to the end. And he comes forward and he's like, no, 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 no. And the little kid comes forward. He looks up and he gives the answer. And the man looks at him and says, no. That's, that's not the answer. I thought you got it incorrect. He packs up his bags, gets on his horse, and starts to ride away. And the little boy runs out. 
He's like, wait, wait. And the man turns around, he's waits right here, so he sees this little kid, the last kid with a book under his arm, right? He sits his fly and his yarmulke being held on one hand and he's got his hand and all the dust is coming off his feet. And he's like, wait, 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 don't leave without me. And the guy stops. He's very excited. He stops the horse and the kid catches up and he's out of breath. <sighs> and the man says, so, do you have the answer, right? And the boy says, no. He said, then what do you want? He goes, I want you to tell me the answer. What was the answer? You can't just leave me. And the man says, you can meet my daughter. <laughs> so the first person who actually wanted to know what the answer was, who had a question. I wasn't looking for answers. I was looking for someone who was willing to ask questions. And he married her. And that's the story. And I think there's a lot of truth, a lot of depth to that story. There always is, right? more than information, stories can reveal a lot more to us about who we are, where we're going, the movements we take, and our mission in the world. And I'll finish with one last idea, if you don't mind. There is an opinion, you ready for this one? This is wild, a little bit Kabbalistic, hope you don't mind. But there's one opinion that the Jewish people had to be spread out in Galut exile over our three and a half thousand years of existence so that other nations could learn from us and even allow converts, sparks of holiness, as they're called, in those other nations to come forward and to convert. Because you haven't got Jews in France, then how about the net French non-Jews that want to come and become part of our people? And there's no Jews in Russia, in Syria, right, in England, or anywhere else. So one reason is they're actually meant to spread the light by being in those nations. It wasn't just for us, it's also for the surrounding society who appreciate us and allow those few people to come forward and then they end up hating us and kicking us out. But until that happens, we can get a lot done. That's all I had to share with you this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Any thoughts, questions, or comments? So it's very important to ask questions because you can constantly learn instead of just providing answers. That's exactly it. Questions are more important than the answers. Which is why I wrote a book called You Got Questions, funnily enough. <laughs> there you go. Available for sale, Amazon.com. <laughs> Shameless plug right there. <laughs>